Amen. I have to be careful this morning about what I say because my mom and sister are here, but also I have to be careful about how hard I hit this pulpit because Friday I was showing them around the church and I accidentally hit it and the manger went all the way down to the first pew there. So we're going to try to make sure that doesn't happen today. All right, well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer together this morning. Lord, we are once again so thankful for what we celebrate during this time of year. Thankful that you are a God who is rich in mercy. That you have shown us the greatest mercy by sending your son, who died on the cross for our sin and who rose again to save all those who profess faith in his name. So Father, this morning I pray for those who have professed faith in Jesus. I pray for every believer here, myself included, that we would be open and receptive to what your word has to say. That we would receive it not as a word of man, but as your good and powerful and saving word. Father, I also want to pray for those who do not know you this morning. Lord, I pray that you will open their hearts to the gospel and that they will be saved. Father, we give you the glory during this time. And may you bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, grab your Bibles this morning and meet with me in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 being verses 18 through 25 as we are continuing in our series we started last week entitled, Behold Your King. And last week we looked at the genealogy of Matthew to see the king's lineage and how Matthew was framing the entire Old Testament in a genealogy and what that means about Jesus. And this morning we're looking at the king's lineage birth from Matthew 1 verses 18 through 25. Now when I was a freshman in high school, my youth group introduced something kind of unique. They introduced a drama team for the youth group. Now I'm not going to lie to you, I was really enticed by the idea of being on a drama team. If you've met me, that shouldn't shock you. That'd be something I'd be interested in. And I loved what we were trying to do with it. We were trying to use these dramas to communicate a biblical story or a story with a biblical truth set to music. And we used this drama team to travel all across the United States. We went to Beaumont, Texas with it. We went to Chicago, Illinois. We went to New York City, which is actually where I preached my very first sermon. And we even took the drama team to Ethiopia. We went across the ocean to not only perform these dramas, but to help this school that, we, uh, that was there. And so I loved my time in the drama team. I loved being a part of it. And some of my fondest memories come from being a part of that team. But while I loved it, I also hated it. It was this love-hate relationship because whenever they were casting roles for a new drama, I always wanted to be a main character, and I never got to be a main character. Now, I know no one is shocked that's how I wanted to be. But I wanted to be a main character, and most of the main, char- the main character in most of these dramas was, of course, Jesus. And they told me I couldn't be Jesus because I had blonde hair and blue eyes. And Jesus didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. And we had a kid in that youth group who, since he was 12, had a full beard and long hair, so he always got to be Jesus. So I was a little frustrated, and there was this one play in particular that we were doing to My Deliver by Rich Mullins. We were putting a drama to that, and we were going to tell the whole biblical story in that one song. And I said, I know they've told me no before, but I want to be Jesus. Not just because he was the main character, but because he was the only consistent role throughout the whole play. And I didn't want to learn multiple parts. I wanted to learn one. And once again, they told me, no, you can't be Jesus. You have blonde hair and blue eyes. But they said, but we'll let you be David and Moses, which I thought was weird that I couldn't be Jesus because I had blonde hair and blue eyes, but I could be another Middle Eastern Hebrew man who definitely had blonde hair and blue eyes. But I didn't mind playing David. I didn't mind playing Moses in that drama. But I got really annoyed when they gave me a minor character, a character that I didn't really think was that important. They gave me the role of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Joseph in this drama only had really one thing to do when this lyric came up and Joseph took his wife and child and they went to the land of Africa. My job was just put my arm over whoever played Mary and lead them into this makeshift cabin with a fake baby that we had. And I hated that because I thought Joseph was such a minor character. 
I mean, we know the story of Jesus' birth. We know the nativity. We think about baby Jesus. We think of Mary, the angels, the shepherds, the wise men. But we really don't give Joseph much thought. He's kind of a minor character in this great, grand story. We know he's the one who almost divorced Mary, but he didn't. And so we often say, well, he's important, but he's not as important as the rest of the characters in the story. But the reality is when we look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, we realize that Joseph isn't a minor character. He's not just somebody who is there. He's a major player in this story. But not only that, I would also argue he's just as important as Mary. That if Joseph didn't do what he was supposed to do in this story, we don't know how this story would have turned out. We would probably wouldn't be celebrating Christmas right now. Because Joseph is not only a major character, and he has a major lesson to teach us. He's just as important as Mary. And so what does Joseph have to teach us this morning, 2,000 years later? What does Joseph's life teach? What does his story teach us uh, 2,000 years after the birth of Christ? Well, Joseph teaches us what it looks like to have a real faith. He teaches us what it looks like to have a faith that is seen by others and that actually works itself out. So what we see from the story of Joseph is this, that your faith is seen by you being merciful and ready to act. Your faith is seen by you being merciful and ready to act. And we see this in Joseph's story beginning in verses 18 through 19 when we see the very first scene of this story, Joseph's dilemma. Read these verses with me. Verse 18 begins, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. So the story begins, we are told that the birth of Jesus came about this way. Mary was pregnant with Jesus, the Holy Spirit knit together the body that Jesus would indwell in Mary. We know this. But Joseph didn't yet. We're told this in verse 18. Joseph wasn't told this until verse 20. So in Joseph's mind, what's going on? Well, his betrothed or his woman he's engaged to with, I know engaged is the closest we can get to in our modern culture, but to be betrothed to somebody, they were practically already married. They were already husband and wife. They just didn't have the ceremony yet to make it official until they could begin living together. So they're about to be married. They're about to have this ceremony. They are tied together. They're already called husband and wife when Joseph discovers that she's pregnant and the baby's not his. Now let's think about that for a moment. We know the story. But let's think about Joseph. This man who is a Hebrew, he's a Jew, he follows the law. In fact, you know, he's the very first person in the, in the New Testament called righteous. He's a righteous man. He's going to marry his beloved Mary. And he finds out the baby's not his. Men, what would you do? What would you do in Joseph's situation? You're about to be married. You're engaged. And you find out that your fiance is pregnant. She tries to tell you that she's still a virgin, but it's God's baby. Are you going to buy it? Are you going to be okay with that, or are you going to do what Joseph did? Or you can go a little further than him. I'm sure you'd be angry, wouldn't you? You'd be hurt, betrayed. But there's a knife in your back. You wouldn't feel great about the situation. And many of us may even want to get vindication against her. We want to be made right. We want to make things better for ourselves. But what does Joseph do? In the midst of his hurt, his pain, his betrayal, does Joseph want to get even with Mary? No. See, Joseph being a righteous man, and being a righteous man meant that he could not ignore the law of God. Because remember, he doesn't know the Holy Spirit knit together the baby that's in Mary's womb. He doesn't know this. So by his, by all outward appearance, Mary has sinned. Mary has sinned against him. And being a righteous man, he can't ignore that. He can't ignore what the law says. In fact, his right would have been not only to divorce her, but to shame her. To shame her for what she had done. To shame her for breaking their covenant. But what does Joseph do? 
he denies his right. Yes, he resolves to divorce her quietly and secretly, but why? He doesn't want to bring shame upon her. So Joseph, in the midst of his pain, in the midst of how he was feeling during this time, he doesn't shame Mary. He doesn't take up his right, if you will, but he shows her mercy. Because he's a righteous man. And this verse teaches that righteousness in the gospel of Matthew always plays itself out by being merciful. So someone who is righteous is someone who shows mercy. Does that describe your life? As a believer who has been made righteous by the blood of Christ, are you merciful? Would you want to get even with Mary or would you do what Joseph did? Because Joseph showed mercy. So he dealt with this. He had to walk through this scenario, this heartbreaking, this painful situation. He resolved to divorce her and to show mercy by not shaming her. He finally figured out what to do, and then the Lord comes and shows him a better way. Isn't that how it often works? We have a situation in life. We try to work through it. We try to figure out what to do, and we finally have a better, but we have a battle plan. The Lord comes and shows us a better way. And the Lord does that for Joseph. Remember, Joseph's a righteous man. He's not in sin to do this against Mary. He's not in sin to divorce her. It's his right. It's his right to shame her. He's being merciful by doing it secretly. In fact, did you know that because he's doing this secretly, the people would have thought this was Joseph's fault? Joseph would have taken the blame. Joseph would have been the one who was made to look bad in the situation. He was the one who was going to take the blame for his beloved. Who does that sound like? Who does that sound like to you? And so, Joseph is shown this better way because while he has this dilemma, we then see his assurance. Joseph is given assurance by the Lord in verses 20 through 23 when the angel comes to him and says, But after he had considered these things, he's made his plan. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David. Now stop there for a moment. Why is that what the angel is calling Joseph? Why does the angel begin by saying son of David? Well, Remember, he's tying it back into the genealogy and he's reminding Joseph who he is. Joseph, son of David. Joseph, the one who comes from the line of David, the one through whom Jesus needs to come. You know why it's so important for Joseph not to divorce Mary? If Joseph divorced Mary and didn't adopt Jesus, Jesus would have no legal right to the throne of David. Joseph must adopt him. Joseph must give him that legal right. So the angel says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So the angel comes, he reminds Joseph who he is. He tells Joseph that he is a son of David. And he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of my plan. Don't be afraid of what I'm doing. It might seem dark right now, but don't be afraid. Because the Lord does his best work in the dark. And so he tells Joseph, what's in Mary's womb? It's not a baby conceived in adultery. It is the eternal Son of God whose body is being knit together in her womb by the Holy Spirit. She hasn't lied to him. She hasn't betrayed him. But Joseph needs to stay with her. And then he tells him, she will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus. Joseph has to be the one to name Jesus. Joseph has to be the one to do that. By naming Jesus, he is saying, this baby is my son So Joseph must name him. He must call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. In this verse, we see who Jesus is and what Jesus does. You know what Jesus means in Hebrew? Yeshua? Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. God saves. That's who he is. But how is Jesus going to do this? Because he will save his people from their sins. Remember, we're in first century Israel. How did Israel think the Messiah was going to come? They thought the Messiah was going to come and conquer their enemies, was going to conquer the government, was going to conquer the Romans, overthrow them, and establish the reign of the Jews forever. That's what Israel thought was going to happen. But Jesus didn't come as a conquering king. He came as a suffering servant. 
He was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. His mission was not to overthrow the Roman government. His mission was to save people from their sins. He is the one who saves. He is Jesus. He is Yahweh in the flesh. He is God manifest in the flesh. He is the one who saves. That's what he does. That's who he is. And then we're told by Matthew in verse 22, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. In Isaiah 7, 14, this is what Matthew is quoting here. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. So Joseph is given this assurance. He is told this baby is the one who will come and save his people from their sins. This baby is the one you've been waiting for. This baby is the Messiah you're longing for. This baby is the one that you've been praying for. It's him. He's here. He's in the womb of your beloved. He's in the womb of your wife, Mary, knit together by the Holy Spirit. You know what we see about the Holy Spirit in this section? We see the primary work of the Holy Spirit, which is to create and recreate. The Spirit was the one who hovered over God's creation in Genesis 1-2. The Spirit is the one who knit together the body of Jesus in the womb of Mary. And the Spirit is the one who gives you a new heart when you profess faith in Christ. He is the one who is renewing you. He is the one who is restoring you. He is the one recreating you. And all this is possible because of the one called Emmanuel. God with us. Now we know what this means. We see it all the time during this season, don't we? But you know how significant it is here? Do you know that Matthew is framing his entire gospel with this promise of God being with his people? In the beginning here, we have a manual which translated God with us. In Matthew 18, verse 20, Jesus says, When two or three gather in my name, there I am among them. And how does Matthew end his gospel? The words of Jesus, and behold, I will be with you always until the end of the age. Matthew is saying, look, God is with us. God took on human flesh. God was born of the virgin. Jesus came. He lived. He died. He rose again. He's with us forever. When you place your faith in Jesus, there's never a moment where he's done with you and he leaves you. No, he's with you always. So important for us to understand that. And this is possible because of what Joseph did. Joseph didn't just say, let me ponder this for a bit, did he? Joseph didn't say, well, let me mull this over. No, we see in this last scene of the story, Joseph's resolve. Verses 24 and 25, when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Joseph did what the Lord called him to do. Joseph being assured that this is the plan of God. Joseph being a righteous man, the one who showed mercy to someone who in his eyes didn't deserve mercy. He showed mercy to Mary. The Lord said, I know what you're doing. I know what you have planned, but I have a better way, and I have a better plan. I'm sending Jesus. So Joseph, name him. By naming him, Jesus has a legal right to the throne of David. Now what does Joseph do? He wakes up and he does just what the Lord said. No hesitation, no retreat, no second guesses, nothing. He does it. Because after his dilemma, he was assured, and now he's resolved to do what the Lord called him to do. He named him Jesus. He married Mary. And Jesus now has a legal right to the throne of David. Do you see how important Joseph is? Do you see how important of a figure Joseph is in this Christmas story? Do you see why we need to understand that he's just as important as Mary? And Joseph demonstrates for us that those who have been made righteous by the blood of Christ are righteous. It's not just something we do. It's not some legalistic thing where we just kind of follow the commands of God and do them and do them to earn his love. No, by those who have been made righteous by Christ, what do we do? Our righteousness needs to play itself out by us being merciful and ready to act. And Joseph's story teaches us just that. So how is our faith seen? How is our righteousness seen to the world? It's seen by us being merciful. And you and I need to be quick to show mercy to others. 
This is what Joseph's story teaches us. We must be quick to show mercy to others. So my question for you is this, in the midst of 2020, pandemic, political season, how merciful have you been? How much mercy have you shown to others this time of year? How merciful are you, or can you even say mercy is a characteristic you can claim? Are you no more for being merciless or being merciful? See, because as believers, we're not called to be a merciless people. No, we've been shown the greatest mercy. We've been shown the greatest mercy by the God who was rich in mercy, as Ephesians 2, 4 tells us. And as those who've experienced the greatest mercy, our sin has been pardoned by the blood of Christ. We've been raised to walk in the newness of life through his resurrection. We must show mercy to others. You must be merciful. But oftentimes we're not merciful. Oftentimes when somebody wrongs us, we want justice. We want to be vindicated. We want to get even. We want to get equal. We want justice when somebody wrongs us. But what happens when we wrong somebody? Oh, then we want mercy, don't we? We want justice when we're wrong, but when we do the wrong, it really wasn't that bad. I don't think you should get mad about this. I think you might be overreacting. I don't know. I, I think I deserve mercy. You may say, well, I don't think I'm that way. Well, there's no relationship in our lives where that's more apparent of our desire to want just when wronged, but our desire to want mercy when we wronged than the relationship between a parent and a child. I mean, think about it for a moment. When you wrong a child, when you do something your child has thought to be wrong, they want justice. They want to be made right. But when they mess up, mercy. They want mercy. Now, y'all know my mom and sister are here this morning, so i got to use a couple of illustrations with her involved in it. But I was the same way. I remember there was a time when I was seven years old, I had to go run some errands with my mom in Tulsa. And I didn't really want to go, and so I made her promise me that if we went, we'd go to Toys R Us after. And she agreed because she didn't think these errands were going to take that long. But when we went to Tulsa, oh, they took a lot longer than we planned on. So by the time these errands were done, we're on the other side of Tulsa. She's tired. Toys R Us is on the other side where we're not at. It's like 5 o'clock. She wants to go home, so she tells me, I'm sorry, we'll go later. But I was 7. I was a child. I had been wronged. And so I demanded my right to go to Toys R Us. I was not going to show mercy. She promised. We did not go to Toys R Us. And I was mad. I wanted justice for my perceived wrong. But when I did something wrong, I wanted mercy. You see, when I was 13, the new Spider-Man 3 movie had just come out. So there's a friend of mine who came over to our, ha- to our house, and we came up with a great idea that we wanted to be like Spider-Man. So what we were going to do is we were going to learn to walk on walls. Now, we were geniuses. Let me make sure you understand this. We said, you know what? The brick's not even. We need to go inside the house and crawl on the walls. That makes more sense. So we had this great plan. My buddy goes first. He runs up the wall. He takes three steps up it, and he just bam, falls off. I'm like, all right, it's my turn. Let's do this. So I look at the wall, I run towards it, and I put my foot up, and the second my foot hit the wall, it went straight through the drywall. And it was low enough to where if you put a picture there, that would look suspicious. So I went, what, are, what am I going to do? So I brought them in there after they got home, and I said, look, I don't think it's that bad. I mean, if you look at it, maybe, it's just easy. There's no need to do anything. No need to punish me here. Definitely not. I didn't do anything wrong. It was a freak accident. Who knew I wasn't Spider-Man? But you see there the the dynamic? I I wanted justice when I thought I was wrong, but I wanted mercy when I did a wrong. And aren't we often the same way? We're wronged. I want justice. When we wrong, I deserve mercy. And that's especially true in 2020, isn't it? Let me ask you this. How merciful have you been this year? We've been in the midst of a pandemic, and I'm being honest with you, I haven't been alive that long, but I've never seen people be more merciless than this year. When it came to this pandemic and all the different opinions, all the different viewpoints, everyone's merciless with each other. 
There's no middle ground. There's no agreement. I'm right. You're wrong. No, uh, you have offended me, so I'm not going to love you anymore. I'm not going to be with you. We can't be friends anymore. This political season, it's been that way too. Who'd you vote for? I don't love you. Who did you vote for? Well, you're wrong. You're dumb. How could you do that? When someone says, would you do this for me? Say, no, it's my right not to do this. It's my right not to listen to people. It's my right to not have to do what I'm asked to do. We've become so focused this year on our rights, we've forgotten mercy. I'm not here to tell you which viewpoint is right and which viewpoint is wrong, but I will tell you this. If your viewpoint leads you to be merciless, you have the wrong viewpoint. If you are merciless, you're wrong. As a believer, you should not be a person who is so consumed, consumed with your rights and being right that you deny mercy. Because mercy has not been denied to you. So many of us are like that unforgiving servant in the parable Jesus told, aren't we? We've been forgiven a great debt. We've been shown mercy. But somebody has a small offense against us. And we're like the servant who threw that person in jail. We're merciless. Is that how a believer should live? Is that how we should be? Can we claim the name of Christ in a mercy that surpasses all understanding if we are the most merciless people on this planet? We can't. We do not need to be people who are so consumed with being right and wanting justice when we're wrong, but mercy when we're wrong, we should flip that. When we wrong somebody, we should be the first people to go and apologize. We should be the first people to know that they didn't deserve that. We should be the first people who go and admit our wrongdoing, not expecting mercy. But when somebody wrongs us, we're to show them mercy. We get it backwards, but we as Christians are to reverse it. Show mercy. Own your wrongs. If you're so focused on your rights or being right, let me remind you, Joseph had the right to shame Mary, but he didn't. God has the right. He would be in the right if he didn't send his son 2,000 years ago. He would be in the right, and when Adam and Eve sinned, he didn't provide a promise. He would be right to say, I'm not going any further with these sinful people. That would be his right. But Christ humbled himself to the point of death, even a death on a cross for you. Why should we deny people mercy when we haven't been denied it? Be merciful. Show mercy to others. It's not easy. It's hard. But it's what God calls us to do. Because Joseph teaches us that we need to be merciful to everyone. But not only that, Joseph teaches us that when we want to live out our faith and our faith is going to be seen, it is seen by us being ready to answer God's call. We are ready to answer God's call call. What did Joseph do? Did he ponder it for a bit when God called him? Did he think about it a little bit? No, he didn't. And you and I as believers, we're called. The question we have to answer, we have to answer is this. Are we ready to answer his call when he calls? And you may say, well, yes, I, I'm ready to answer. If he calls me to lead a Sunday school class, he calls me to start a D group, a life group, I'm ready to answer his call. I'm ready when he calls me to do something. I'll be ready when he does it. But did you know that God is calling you right now? He's calling you right now. But what's he calling you to do? Spend time with him. Read his word. Pray. Share your faith. Worship. He's calling you right now to do actions that you often ignore. And if you ignore what he's calling you to do today, how can you say you'll answer his call tomorrow? You can't. Are you answering his call right now? Are you answering his call today? You might be sitting here this morning. You're saying, well, I'm a believer, but I'm merciless. I, I don't show mercy to others. God is calling you to repent today. Will you answer his call? You might say, well, I'm an unbeliever. I don't know Jesus. I don't have a relationship with him, but I need to be saved. Will you answer his call? There is a call before all of us here this morning. As a believer, it is to be a merciful people because we have been shown mercy. And you as an unbeliever, your call is to receive this mercy from the God who is rich in it. 
And as a believer, if you accept his call, I'm going to warn you, being merciful is not easy. It's hard. This past week, I experienced that. On Friday, we took my mom and my sister to the Ark Encounter, which was really awesome, by the way. You should go. But afterwards, we had a midway stop in Lexington, and I got to pick where we ate, which means we were, of course, going to Malone Steakhouse. Amen, right? I heard that. All right. Thank you, Freddie. (laughs) We were going, but we had some, oh, it's Todd, my bad. Well, Freddie was nodding. We went to Malone's, and they told us to be about an hour away, and that was fine. We had some things to do in the meantime, so we, we went. We got a reservation. We waited for an hour, and then we waited for an hour 15, then an hour 20, and I'm hungry. We're all hungry. So I go out to ask the hostess what's taking so long. Now, when I went up there, I was expecting it to be easy. Oh, your table's ready right now, but when I went up there, she said, I'm sorry, sir, it's going to be another 20 to 30 minutes. Now, I didn't say anything to her to degrade her, but I wanted her to know that I was unhappy with that. So I rolled my eyes, I shook my head, and I said, whatever, and I walked away. And about 20 minutes later, our table was ready. But you know, while I did enjoy my steak, there's never a moment where I won't enjoy that. That whole experience, there was something heavy on me. I began to think about how I was preparing a sermon about mercy, and I hadn't shown her any. I began to think about how if that woman were to make any assumptions about me, she wouldn't assume I was a believer. My faith was not seen to her. I was just like the world. So what did I have to do? I owed her an apology. So when we were done eating, I went and I apologized to her. I'm not saying that so you think, wow, our pastor's great. No, I'm letting you know your pastor fails a lot. Quite often, actually. Because being merciful isn't easy. Being merciful isn't natural to us. It's against our sinful nature. But if we're not merciful, how can we expect people to see our faith? Our faith that believes that we've been shown a great mercy. If we're not merciful, then others won't see it. Because reality is, during this time of year, during this season, we talk about having hope, joy, and peace because of the birth of Christ. And listen, we're also called to spread that hope, joy, and peace. We can't do that if we look just like the world. So the question we have to answer this morning is, is your faith seen? Or are you just like the world too? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? As a believer, you might be saying this morning that you have been struggling to show mercy. That people wouldn't know you were a believer by the way you act. That people wouldn't know that you've been shown a great mercy by the way you live. And if that's you here this morning, God is calling you to repent. He is calling you to turn away from whatever you've been acting. Turn away from your bitterness. Turn away from your pride. Turn away from whatever holds you back. And resolve to show mercy. It won't be easy. You will fail. But the mercy of God is greater still. So if that's you here this morning. And you need to repent of being merciless. Then I want to call you to do that. You can do that right where you're sitting. If you feel comfortable. You can come forward and pray. At the pews here at the stairs here. But let us all leave here as believers. Resolving to be a merciful people. Not merciless. And if you're in here and you're not a believer, you don't have a relationship with Christ, you never profess Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you need to respond to the calling of God this morning and be saved. And the good news is you will repent of your sin, turn away from your sin and place your faith in Christ as your Savior and Lord, then you will be saved. Would you do that this morning? Would you respond to God's call? And for all of us, will we answer His call? Father, we love you. And we trust you. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to pour yourself out among this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You come this morning as the Lord leads.